Okay, cool. So, I was going to ask you to go into whatever knowledge you have, because you mentioned before about the switch of the Hawaiian religion into Christianity. Yeah, well, my um, knowledge of that, or my um, what I take off of that is that when, when Western man came to Hawaii, you know, first the ship captains, then religion came, missionaries. And at the same time, that's when a lot of the disease came. So, you know why? Nine out of 10 people in every village died mm. within 50 years of contact. Mm. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of wisdom was lost, you know, with the elders had dying so quickly, so much people dying. I mean, nine out of 10 people. Mm. That's, you come to a place like Honauna or like Napopo, you get 50 people and only get five left. Mm. That's pretty big. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm. Western man started to um, preach their one God met um, way of, of religion and at the same time it was about the time that Kamehameha was getting, he was, he was old, um, he was dying and his favorite wife, Ka'ahumanu, who was the pretty much second in charge, mm -hmm. she was the regent and um, the only way she could keep you know, the, the power she had was to have Kamehameha sec first, second, break the, how it happened, how the religion was, um, done away with or abolished was because the rules of the, you know, within the kapu system or the, the rules that everybody had to live by, which was one, you know, a bunch of rules, but only one punishment, and punishment is death. Mm -hmm. Or make it into a pool, who no, like it, who no, now. Mm -hmm. um, so she had King Camille's heir, his oldest son, to eat with the women or eat with her. And that was a, a no no. Mm. So by eating with her, agreeing to eat with her, and eating in the same room, or in mm. the same hut, um, he broke the law. So then came to the, came to where, okay, he just broke the law, so what, what are they gonna do now? And she convinced mm. him to do away with the Hawaiian system, mm. the Hawaiian religion, and those rules, and adopt this new God, mm which she had been hearing about, you know, pre mm. all these missionaries preaching. And um, that's pretty much how the system changed over mm. from the ancient Hawaiian religion mm. to the Western man's religion. Um, one of the last battles, you know, there was, there was those who didn't want to change mm. and those that, you know, accepted it. Mm. So there was a big um, war that happened here on the big island. Mm. And actually between here and Ono now is where that war hap uh, mm. occurred. That was the, that's why this place is called the battlegrounds between Ono now and Napopo. The area is called the battlegrounds and that's because there was a big battle that happened there. Um, so you know, when get, 
when the people are so um, into religion, I mean, everything they did, they prayed, they asked, had all these different gods that they had to, you know, mm. um, appease and go by their rules. And so, um, when that system was abolished, I mean, they went to all the heiaus and destroyed the tikis, killed the priests. Mm. Um, this one here, and Honau now, I think, were the only two that was too powerful for them to mm. uh, break mm. the kapu or you know the sacredness and destroy the temple and the he um, you know the heiaus and Honau now, the place of um, Pu'ohonua or Honau now. And that's part of the reason why Hawaiians became so literate when they started changing, um, um, putting Hawaiian language into written or, or, or writing. Um, Hawaiians wanted to learn about the new gods, so that a lot of them had to learn how to read and write mm -hmm. or read so that they could read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that is how um, a lot of the, uh, the people became literate. Mm -hmm. not, not literate in, um, I don't know how, how to, I guess it was translated into Hawaiian mm. because they first learned their own, la our own language was written in Hawaiian, mm -hmm. but with Amer you know, Western letters and mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that much about the religious part about it, but um, I can see where, you know, if you into religion and all of a sudden your, your system is outlawed and a new system put in place, and with all the people dying at the same time, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you kind of need one, some kind of mm -hmm. higher power to mm -hmm. hope, you know, have hope and, mm -hmm. and get through. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, how I look, that's what I've learned about how religion and you know, the two religions mm -hmm. change from one to the other. Mm -hmm. So it's not much, but that's what I know. No, that's fascinating. Thank you for that information about what happened here that makes sense um it like almost like yeah like completes a, a puzzle piece for me in that way um and i know a little bit too that at least uh, in the beginning of the um the poem to the elite uh yeah. that book i forget what the the name of it is you're right the Kumulipo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think it's in the foreword. It's not in the translation, but in the foreword, Lili Uokalani talks about how there was like a prophecy of like the Lono coming, coming back. That was one of his promises, and that was you know when Captain Cook came. That's why everybody thought he was like a god. His sails looked like Lono's symbol. The one of the biggest clues that. Captain Cook wasn't a god. It was when he had two, two of his crew died. So the Hawaiians started thinking, gee, how can a god uh -huh. have his servants die? Uh -huh. Or his, you know, people in his uh -huh. group die? Uh -huh. But he's a god. Mm -hmm. And so that little pinnacle in front of the heiau, down at the bay, that's a representation of or a monument to those two mm. Western mm. sailors that died. Mm. And um, I guess the bones are here somewhere. Oh, wow. But that's, you see a little obelisk right in front of the temple? Yeah. Right in front of the path to go up. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. That used to have a plaque on top of the island. Oh, wow. A lot of the locals thought that that wasn't the right place for that, so they took the plaque off. Interesting. Oh. Somebody's freaking out. Oh. 
Mm. Mm. I don't like a day to do this. Mm. Somebody's mm. upset. Mm -hmm. Because in real Hawaii, I don't know nothing like that built around me. Mm. This island alone was said to have almost a million people just on this mm -hmm. island mm -hmm. and living off of everything that came from the land. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I tried to, well, I, what I always tell visitors when they come is Hawaiians took care of the land so much, so well, that after all of us living here for so long, the place is still paradise. Mm -hmm. That's because the ones before you took care of it really good. And you know, we're not doing a real good job at all. Yeah. So, something for them to think about. Mm -hmm. Like for myself, I had to learn how to be Hawaiian again. Mm -hmm. What was being Hawaiian? You know, what was the values? Of? And, um, so I think as we learn more about the old ways and see how well it worked, mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's it's only natural to want to go back to that way mm -hmm. and, and make sure those, that wisdom not lost. Mm -hmm. So more guys picking up and, you know, the resurgence of Hawaii pretty much came with Hokule at a voyaging canoe. Mm -hmm. That's where the Hawaiian Renaissance mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. started where people wanted to be Hawaiian again. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time when I went to school, you know, if you was an Hawaiian guy, you was automatically one uh, troublemaker. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're on a lower level than the other kids mm -hmm. because you're Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just how it was, it portrayed that, you know, all our Hawaiians are lazy because they didn't want to work in a plantation. So a Western man called them lazy. Mm -hmm. And our Hawaiian says, you know, why would I go and work for you in this, doing this hard work during that time that is, you know, normally we don't work, we get the beach, we're cooling off at the ocean, we're relaxing. You know, we've been up early in the morning when the sun came, mm -hmm. first came up, we were up. <laughs> tending our fields or doing our crops. And then Western man, you know, he wants you to work from sun up to sunset. And um, Hawaiians just couldn't understand. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, why would I do that? It seems, <laughs> seems illogical. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's you know, climactic. You're going with the climate and mm -hmm. Still living by nature. Yeah. When hot, why be in a hot sun? I mean, it's getting crispy. And when it's cool, well, now's the time to get out there and do your, you know, do your chores, what you need to do. Mm -hmm. It just makes a whole, a whole lot more sense. And then we have these Western, you know, missionaries coming with their overcoats. I mean, mm -hmm. three layers of clothes, a t-shirt, a shirt, and then a coat over that. On top of that, you, you get a hat and you get shoes because your feet too soft to walk on the hot lava or walk on rocks. And so, you know, Hawaiians just put on all this stuff. It's like, holy moly, what the heck? And go back to the way that they normally live mm -hmm. until, you know, more, um, as, as you progress, in 1990, you get 19, 10, you know, 10 more years. And like, my, you know, when my grandmother grew up, she had to wear regular clothes, mm -hmm. walk six miles to go to school only to have a nun keep discipline her because mm -hmm. she cannot, she just not talking in English. Mm -hmm. She's trying to, you know, talk to other kids in Hawaiian. 
And so that, you know, really we kind of, um, that's kind of the pressure for the people to become civilized, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. From, you know, what Western man or the overthrowers see as the, the progression of westernizing this, mm -hmm. this place and eventually taking over and, you know, making it on state. <laughs> Statehood is, I think Statehood Day is this weekend or something, I don't mm. know. Mm. Really close to Statehood Day, 23rd, 4th, maybe, mm. I'm not sure. That was like the end of, or what Hawaiians perceived to be the end of Hawaii. Mm. So I guess for more Hawaiians, you gotta, you gotta speak up and make sure that our kids and their kids will grow up thinking the way we thought it was done and gone. Mm -hmm. Because it's not it's not done and gone. And even the elders said, always said it's not Hawaii is not gone until there's no aloha. Mm -hmm. When no more aloha then then it's not Hawaii anymore. Mm -hmm. Call it something else but it's not Hawaii. And even till today, even within just that, knowing that, you know, um, a lot of things were done illegally, uh, treaties, declarations, whatever. The reason Hawaii became a state was if America had abided by the UN Charter, like all the other countries, France, England, um, what is Belgium, the Netherlands, all those countries that had territories all over the world, but because of the our UN Charter, all territories were supposed to be given back to their native countries and allowed to uh, rule themselves or stay within, you know, go, go back to being a territory of some mm -hmm. other country. Hawaii, we never was given that opportunity. They made it a state. Mm. And so that way, um, they didn't have to go by the mm. UN Charter. Mm. So, you know, from from its first inception, like the whole thing is just, it's rigged for the most powerful countries to rule mm. and, and have, you know, have things go their way than it is to um, abide by the rules. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, by the real rules, Hawaii should have went back to being a monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, rulers that were voted upon by the people. So, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a whole big mess. I have different People that I know have different, just different views on um, on who's actually in charge. Mm -hmm. And even when you get to that, who's actually in charge? We can't even say who's in charge of you know the um, America. So how can we even get to, down to who's in charge of Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Because yes. Hawaiian, there are Hawaiians that believe that we're still in a state of war, mm -hmm. and others that believe um, we were nation held in limbo because we're not recognized mm -hmm. as a nation. Mm -hmm. The only way to have change, if it's if that's not if, because that's the way it is, then Hawaii need more support. Mm -hmm. More mm -hmm. people need to know the truth so they can make up their own mind and either um, oppose or agree. And you know, there's still not enough people that agree mm -hmm. that what was wrong is wrong and mm -hmm. there should be a, 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 a different government in place in Hawaii. 
making different choices that um, more reflect the Hawaiian people than Western economics, pretty much, yeah. because that's what it, mm -hmm. it's all about, is money. Yeah, it's way different. I mean, like I said, it's just some mm -hmm. this huge thing. I myself believe that we are under martial law because um, you know what evidence that I have seen people I've talked to I agree that you know in their um, interpretation of because I mean, everything is found or how you interpret words on a piece of paper and what it means. That's how you're going to base your conclusions. Mm -hmm. So my conclusion is that we're still under martial law. So, you know, the military is so strong. I know for a fact that back in the early 90s and probably a lot even all the way back that there's been uh, a method of quieting the, um, those who have the argument to view their conclusions their way. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, America is not beyond assassination. Mm -hmm. We, um, the military, uh, a lot of times is used to quite dissension. That's the word of the people, dissension. Mm. People that don't agree mm. and have an argument that others agree with it and accept and follow. Mm. And once it gets too much or your case is too good, then somehow you disappear. Mm -hmm. A lot of Hawaiian families have stories of how grandpa they never like sell this big tract of land that the sugar cane or the plantation or the military wanted. Um, had a bad car accident someplace that you know normally people don't have accidents there but mm. grandpa mm. did and he mm. you know being the one in charge mm. things change quick. Mm. Especially as as you move up the generations where you know you get away from the land is the most important to the dollar is more important mm. wealth and stature mm. over um, holding the land so it's not abused or um, its resources are depleted mm. I know of quite a few families that, mm. you know, talk of that. And in the ancient times, those lesser chiefs that were in charge, you know, spoke for the king or was the Konohiki. The Konohiki was the guy in charge of one ahapua'a, one land division, one piece of the pie from the mountain to the sea. Mm. And so he had a lot of land. Whereas the common people, you know, they were allowed to live there and, and be there as long as they took care of the place. But the Konohiki would remove them from the land, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of well, the next person. There are plenty more people that mm -hmm. um, could use that or somebody would use it in a better way. The older ones were left in charge because they had more experience mm -hmm. in life. So their, their book of... Um, incidents, I guess you could call them, or, you know, just how life was progressing, give them a better chance of making clear decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and like I, I, I was talking about at one point, I said, you know, how Hawaii was a, a one nation under God. It really was because the Ali'is, before any um, major action was taken 
it was always taken with the guidance from the gods. So, like prayer, a lot of prayer, a lot of listening for messages, um, you know, asking the gods for the wisdom that they needed. Ali was, they were basically humans, like of us all, but held on a higher. on a higher plane of respect, I guess, because to be a ruler, you had to provide a genealogy that takes you back to a time when the gods were, well, I guess that, that, that's how all, all of the East felt that they were, you know, um, of the gods. Mm -hmm. They were from someplace else or some higher power there. I don't know if you. Send it. I don't know if you want to go there. Let me know. We can just put a pin in it, and we can talk about it, and not have it recorded. But I've always kind of questioned and wondered because I've heard stories and I've seen in my experiences they were real tall. Yeah, Hawaiians are tall. Hawaiians are tall, yeah. but these guys were like big. So I've always kind of wondered if they really were kind of like descendants from like the Anunnaki, the the ancient, you know, and if they track that bloodline of, of people that had more of that star DNA. I would think so. I mean, yeah. um, that, that's how you prove that you were from someplace else or, mm. or, or some higher power. Mm. Was to be able to track your lineage, your lineage, mm. your, your, um, your ancestors, mm -hmm. where you came from, what's your bloodline. Mm -hmm. I guess, and you know, I also think that people were bigger, not only maybe because they're from someplace else, but because of the foods and how they mm. ate their um, their lifestyle. Mm. You know, their um, How they viewed themselves in that relevance of the, the circle, yeah, mm. The, mm. the whole, I guess. Because, mm. 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 you know, I, I see today that kids and people and, you know, obese people, mm. how Hawaiians, they, um, there's plenty of Hawaiians that overweight, diabetic, they don't really live too long. Their their mortality is in the sixties and seventies, and then you get people from Japan or some place else where they they're in their eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that has a lot to do with the foods that were given to the people, canned goods, mm -hmm. you know, spam, luncheon. All that canned stuff, that, uh, the rationing for World War II, you know, all, the, all the fresh meat went to the military, all the, the fresh produce went to the military, and canned goods went to the regular people. So when you get into the plantation, a lot of those people. had their garden yet. But they had a lot of their own. They ate a lot more vegetables. They didn't depend so much I think, mm -hmm. on the military because the plantation was taking care of them. You know, if you're in a plantation, of course you're gonna want your workers strong and healthy. Whereas the Hawaiian Hawaiian they kept they, they were um, and mostly by the plantation. They were cheated out of their land. Or had, had such a thing as quiet title action where if nobody's at one certain place and I claim the land, after so long I get to keep it. It's not put in my name. And whatever you, you know, that's like my friend Abel. Mm -hmm. um, the land he lived on was 
given to his family at the uh, the Great Mahele when the system changed from royalty owning all the land to where the royalty had uh, royal land and had government land and had public land and so that's that's where the dividing up of property went to different mm. families mm. prior to that never have no system like that mm. so Hawaiians were kind of like wanderers, I would, say, I would think, mm. you know, not being secure as to where they were. Because mm. if the plantation wanted it, then what they normally do is landlock you. Buy as much of the land around you, they not let you pass through the land. Mm. So you couldn't go to another, you couldn't go to the ocean to get your food. Mm. You, couldn't do, you couldn't trade with another family or someone else in another mm. area because to get there, the land is all owned. And it's now private land. You cannot cross on our land mm. at all. So um, eventually, people decide to give up their place and go into the towns and cities, mm. and then have to find some kind of means of uh, providing for their family. Mm. Pretty much like the Indians, you know. They, the, the difference was that with the Indian tribes, they were given one place to live, big la uh, track of land. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, like we know, there was a given the, the good land, mm -hmm. the land that, you know, you could actually survive mm -hmm. year to year and, and make a homestead out. Mm -hmm. Hawaiians is the same way. A lot of Hawaiian homes land is the, plant, the places that are really rocky, so you cannot grow much there, or um, way in the middle of no place, where you know there's no infrastructure, so no roads, no uh, water, um, no means of working the land to provide. A lot of places the water was diverted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where the water, you know, when it rained, the water would wet all the land. Um, it went to where the water would go into what, be, you know, small rivers that became large rivers. And at the bottom of those large rivers was usually a sugar mill. Mm. So you could process the sugar cane, mm. um, boil it down to molasses, get it on a ship, and get it back to. California, Hawaii sugar. Mm -hmm. So back to the U.S. of A. Mm -hmm. And most people don't understand that you know, part of America's big deficit was the subsidy of sugar. Mm -hmm. Where America paid four or five times the actual face value of sugar that was exported to America. Mm. So, you know, the plant, and, and that's why the plantations thrive, because mm. free money. Sugar's worth 30 cents, and America's giving us a dollar 20 cents a pound. Mm. So, you know, mm. the corruption that just happens there, and that was the means of you know, holding big areas of land. Keeping them because if they was only going to get three cents a pound, a lot of them couldn't survive. Mm. And that's what happened after uh, Ronald Reagan took office. Mm. You know, he said he was going to balance the budget, and the first thing he did, or one of the first things he did, was stop the stop the subsidy for sugar. Mm. And when that happened, now plantations they're not making money; they're losing money. Mm the way it should have been for, you know, the past mm. hundred or so years that's mm -hmm. been going on. I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's the um, shipping costs. To ship sugar from Hawaii, 
when you add that into the cost of producing the sugar, it becomes, or anything else, I mean, they bring stuff from the mainland to Hawaii and, you know, the price skyrockets because the shipping costs. So now you imagine taking stuff back to America, which is against the trade, against the rotation of the earth. I mean, you get everything working mm. against you to get things going mm. back to the east side mm. or, or mm. eastward. And so there was, there was no way, I, I don't see how sugar would have ever um, been or actually anything that you produce here and try to export to somewhere else mm. being the, um, a landmass mm. so far to ship things, mm -hmm. you know, the cost is just, I mean, everything is more expensive here yeah. and it's all because of shipping. When oil prices, gas prices go up, everything here goes up. Mm -hmm. And once it goes up, it don't come back down. Yeah. Fairly, fairly never. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, yeah, everything goes up. And now, right now, is the cost of lumber. Mm -hmm. on, on the mainland, too. Yeah, you know, but in I can Hawaii, imagine it's, here, it's yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. When sheet of plywood that used to cost thirty bucks now is a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So everything is just it's getting out of reach. Um, from as far back as my daughter was born, I can remember thinking that there's no way she's going to be able to afford getting her buying her own place in Hawaii. And then she go, goes to the mainland, makes money there, and then comes back. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of Hawaiians that go to the mainland, they end up never coming back because there's the opportunity and the convenience of being there and the exposure to Western way. Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 dog eat dog world is. You stay there with those dog eat dog worlds. Mm -hmm. Some of them do get to make it back, but I think a majority of the people don't. You know, they go to the mainland to um, get ahead and never get far enough ahead that they can come home. Mm -hmm. My sister and brother are you know, examples of that, mm -hmm. going to the mainland for one reason or another. And, finding themselves either without the means or without the desire to come back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. My sister, she'd like to come home, but she, um, you know, her mom, my mom, they, we don't have our own place anymore. Mm -hmm. Our own family land. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose I have six acres in Maui, which is my grandmother's. Mm. But when she got sick, needed a heart operation, um, she decided to you know, sell her six acres mm. so she could have this operation, which you know, would, have, would have been my uh, inheritance, was sold, but there's a lot of other Hawaiians that, you know, they're, they lost their homeland or their lands given to them by the Kingdom of Hawaii that were either cheated or mis mm. misguided to think they were going to get a, a better deal. Mm. And, or like the, you know, the family fear. There's three heirs and one heir wants to sell because they want the money. And the other two heirs don't want the money. But if if it goes into a courtroom, then the resolution is to sell the land or the other heirs pay off that one. Mm. Now, if nobody's got money, then the land's put, put up for sale and split three ways. Mm. 
So no matter what, you lose out. Mm. And then, you know, like, you know, we talk and we say, yeah, what's, you know, once you guys sell the land, then you guys, your, your family heritage not here in the Bay anymore. Mm. Eventually, you're going to be forgotten. Mm. And probably not in history anymore, not part of, you know, the, um, the genealogy of the place. And everything's different, and that's. I think there's. I would say 75 house sites here, maybe 25 are still in Hawaiian or local hand, and the rest are in, owned by some Westerner. Mm -hmm. And and those places are either. Um, they're pretty much blocked off from being used by locals. Mm -hmm. So eventually you get to look like, you know, Kailua or the ocean mm -hmm. Ali'i Drive where mm -hmm. everybody on the ocean side of the road you find maybe ten maybe two people in in a mile of shoreline that mm -hmm. still own the land in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And the rest are all Westerners because mm -hmm. it became so expensive. Um, either through taxes or through greed. Mm, mm. You know, money was more important than that small piece of land right there by the beach. Mm. And maybe luckily someone from that family had you know, moved someplace else and bought a lot mm. or made good and it's got someplace else mm. that they can go to. Mm. So, yeah. It's, um, and, and you also get the government that comes in and just says, oh, well, we're going to condemn all this land because it's not safe for you to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, our, like, the land we had when I was born, after the tidal wave, that was all condemned and, mm -hmm. and they, they gave, they put one street that was for the victims of the tidal wave that had been displaced because of the government just condemning their land and saying, you can't live there no more. Mm. I mean, if I could, if we still owned our place, we'd have, we'd be right where the uh, golf course driving range is in Hilo. Mm. So. Mm. And then you see, you know, 25, not even 25 years later, after the tidal wave and the land's condemned, then now the government's leasing it to some big entity that's, you know, killed in or something to put up a big hotel mm -hmm. and give them a 25 year lease or a 50 year lease. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Now you took us off our land, took our land. And because you said nobody can be there because it's a dangerous place to live. And then you put up all this thing. Mm -hmm. And mm. you know it's it's um I guess you know like for my grandmother and my grandparents it's kind of disheartening mm. and, and to be, have to watch mm. what goes on. I mean, my grandma I could just imagine how she felt from you know being born in Maui, um, the youngest of nine, and living the way she lived, being born in the 20s, and you know, she died in the 80s. Um, how much change and unfairness mm. that they lived through. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just amazing. Of, how they coped with that. Mm. You know, and, and that's where you get a lot of Hawaiians or natives that become addicted to alcohol mm. to try and block it all off. Mm. Drugs, alcohol, and, and being violent mm. because you're always angry. Mm -hmm. The anger's inside, you know. Mm. Like we heard a little, little mm -hmm. while earlier, you know, how people um, 
right there at the at the pier where it used to be open for everybody. Now only the commercial activities can use that pier. There's a gate with a key and the only guy get the key is if you get one permit and a business mm -hmm. and you're doing kayak tours, you're the only guy that can use the pier. Mm -hmm. Okay, park in there. It's like wait a minute, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. There's a bit of resentment in there. Mm. Kind of talk. Um, yeah, like the others say, we're no more aloha, we're no more Hawaii. Yeah. And, and the way to receive that aloha is by giving it. Mm. So those who come here with that in their heart mm -hmm. of you know being okay and sharing and you know wanting to get along, you get along. Mm. And those that come here with a chip on their shoulder and their own agendas, um, you know they say the land look out for itself. Well, mm -hmm. that's kind of like how it is, you know. Mm -hmm. You get what you give. Mm -hmm basically the rules of life. Maybe it's just a little bit more intense here. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're pretty good for today. That's good for today. Thank you, Maggie.